Welcome back to Definitely Not Definitive. I'm Ken. And I'm Bethany. We're just a couple of kooky, crazy kids in love that love reacting to Fallout. Yes, we do. And so uh, excited for this one. End of season one, Fallout, season one, episode 18, The Storyteller. Ooh. Yeah, so it always ends on a good, good cliffhanger, but the fact that now we're going to figure out who the storyteller is, uh, that's amazing. So yeah. if you want early app free access to our uh, Fallout reactions and other reactions on Definitely Not Definitive, uh, check out the description of this video because we got a link to our Patreon there, as well as a link for a playlist for all of our Fallout reactions. Yeah. Ready? Uh, no. Oh, every time. <laughs> because we haven't introduced our drink. Yep. For those who've been following along with us on this journey, you're already familiar with this. This is our Stim Pack Spritzer because it has a Stim Pack. So yeah. you gotta put the Stim Pack in. You gotta mix it up a little bit. It's some revitalizing energy. It is. And for once, I don't have Bucky on my lap, so I actually get to do this on camera, which is really fun. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. You've experienced the Fallout series in your own way want to learn more about its story. Well, to get to the heart of the story, you have to go back to the beginning. over 200 years ago, and the people who remember the days before the bombs fell are fewer in number each year. Ghouls, brains in jars, alien abductees, and a handful of pre-war tycoons who had life support systems ready to go when the worst hit. Among the people who were alive in the back when times is a man who some call a ghoul. Others say he's one of the very first mutants. To those of us who've known him a while, he's just Harold. Harold? Harold was a child when the war began back in 2077. He wasn't exactly a historian at that age, doesn't remember the global war over the dwindling supply of oil and uranium, the desperate fight in Anchorage, Alaska, where America and China fought like alley cats over the last drops of fuel in the world. Damn. He survived the war inside one of the vaults and was twice the lucky duck for getting into one of the good ones. <laughs> the vaults were part of an experimentation scheme while some were really supposed to protect the dwellers within, many more were designed to go horribly awry so that the government could study how humanity adapted to outlandish situations. Like a thousand kids with no grown-ups, or an army of defective clones running amok. One vault even had an entire society based around ritual human sacrifice. Harold emerged from his vault in 2090 into a wasteland where the first generation of survivors were forging their new civilization. Small communities had sprung up, and Harold and some of the other vault dwellers eked out a living as merchants and prospectors, but he was unlike the others. He prospered, became a respectable merchant with his own caravan. His life changed when around 2102, he and Richard Gray mounted an expedition to find the source of the mutants harassing their caravans. They tracked them to the old military base in Mariposa, California a secret place from before the war, surrounded by some of the most horribly mutated critters the Wasteland held at Ooh. the time. Jesus. Most of Harold's companions were killed before they got inside the place, but Harold and his friend Richard survived, in a sense. Comparing Harold's yes. stories with records the Brotherhood recovered from that base, it's not hard to guess at what must have happened to Harold and Richard. They'd been exposed to an extreme dose of the forced evolutionary virus, and each of them had developed a unique set of mutations. Richard became an abomination unlike anything seen in the wasteland since. Harold, on the other hand, turned into something that looked like a ghoul, although he was an entirely unique being. Folk in the hub didn't know about super mutants back then, so they treated him like any other ghoul, which wasn't well. He lost his business, customers, friends. He took to loitering in the out-of-the-way parts of the hub and he was happy to tell his story to anyone who would talk to him. Coming from the vaults as he did, Harold could recognize a fellow vault dweller when he saw one. He swears up and down that back in 2162, he met THE vault dweller, the savior of the wasteland. Hmm. Harold didn't know he was in the presence of greatness. To him, the vault dweller looked like any other lost soul wandering around Old Town. It took a long time for word to spread about the vault dweller's deeds. 
and for folk to piece together all the tales about that person from Vault 13. Vault 13 was designed to stay shut for 200 years, but its water purifier broke down 120 years early, and its overseer sent out an exceptional young person to look for a replacement. The overseer knew little of the wasteland, but Vault Tech Records told them that there were other vaults nearby, and the young vault dweller set off in search of nearby Vault 15. Vault 15 had long since been plundered, but its inhabitants founded a nearby village called Shady Sands around 2121, and those folk pointed the vault dweller to some of the larger towns in California. Places like Junktown and The Hub had all sorts of pre-war salvage, but no water chips. The vault dweller did meet Harold in The Hub, even though neither of them realized it was a moment of destiny. The vault dweller eventually found a replacement ship in the ghoul city of Necropolis. It was built on top of Vault 12, and they had a water chip that ended up saving Vault 13. It seemed that the vault dweller had saved the day, but saving the day is never that easy in the wasteland. Even as the vault dweller set about the humble quest for water, a secret and malevolent force was at work in the wasteland. Necropolis wasn't just full of ghouls, it was invaded by the first generation of super mutants, and the vault dweller was among the first people in the wasteland to encounter them and live to talk of it. The Brotherhood of Steel found the corpse of one of the mutants, but didn't know what to make of the thing. They couldn't believe that some wasteland wanderer might be able to help them, but all the same, they sent the vault dweller out on a fool's errand to one of the most desolate spots in the wasteland. It turned out that he was able to succeed where others had failed and <laughs> unraveled the source of the super mutant army and the location of its leader. In doing so, the vault dweller finally found out what happened to Harold's old friend Richard. After the super mutants were scattered by the vault dweller, he wandered north, gathering outcasts from vault society and other followers. They formed a tribe far up north in Arroyo, not as sophisticated as life in the vaults, but at least they were free of overseers, vault tech, and all the problems of pre-war society for a time. The vault dweller had passed on, but a few of the people who knew him were still alive in their old age. Harold was among them. His unique mutation has given him long life among other interesting traits. By the 2240s, he had a tree branch growing out the side of his head. Wow. Made him stand out among the other ghouls, at least. I would think so. He met the <laughs> Chosen One when he was living in a ghoul city called Gecko. The Chosen One was said to be the direct descendant of the Vault Dweller, and like his predecessor, he was sent on a quest to acquire some old world gizmo made by Vault Tech. This time, instead of a water chip, it was something called a Garden of Eden creation kit a fancy fusion-powered device that could transform a stretch of the wasteland into a fertile patch of paradise. The elders of Arroyo sent their chosen one out to track down the location of their homeland, Vault 13. The overseers of Vault 13 had always been a mite paranoid about the outside world, so they kept their location a secret right until their bitter end. The Chosen One had to trek all over Northern California, looking for any place or anyone associated with the old vaults. Harold and the other ghouls and Gecko had been trying to live in peace with the folk of Vault City, a community that had sprung up around Vault Number 8. Vault 8 had already used their Gek, but the Chosen One still lent a hand in resolving their dispute with the ghouls. That was Harold's second brush with greatness. <laughs> Harold wasn't the only one who knew both the Vault Dweller and the Chosen One. Tandy, the president of the NCR at the time, had met the Vault Dweller in her youth. She saw some potential in the Chosen One, and talked them into doing some political dirty work to unite the territories around vaults 13 and 15. Even back then, the NCR was constantly scheming to rope in new territory, just like they are now in the Mojave. The Chosen One ended up stumbling across a plot to wipe out humans worldwide, perpetrated by some of the descendants of the very weasels who had subverted Project Safehouse and turned the vaults into twisted experiments back before the war. Somehow, this chosen one, a mere tribal savage, outwitted the Enclave, one of the most advanced factions in the wasteland. Some old-timers in the Mojave still remember seeing the vertebrates flying east, never to return. This is like a recap of the entire season. The mm -hmm. Enclave wasn't the only organization that decided to see what was going on in the east. The Brotherhood of Steel had sent out an expedition to Chicago, but lost touch with them. Another team, of course, marched all the way across the country to Washington, D.C. to scour the eastern seaboard for technology. 
By this time, that little branch in Harold's head had grown into a full-sized tree with Harold trapped inside, and he was rooted to the spot. On the bright side, he had a group of apostles who thought he was a god, magically spreading greenery to the dying land. They took care of Harold for the most part, even though he grew a little crankier every day. <laughs> His tree minders would only let people talk to Harold if you drank their magic potion first. It was really some kind of chem made from tree sap. Can't rightly recall what happened to Harold. We can only hope that people who visit him in his oasis take the time to talk with him and remember his contributions to the wasteland. Once things started to settle down in the east, a new world had sprung up in the west. The, the tribal villages in Arizona had been raised or conquered by what looked to be something out of the history books. The Roman Legion had returned and set about civilizing the savages, all because some would-be emperor had found the wrong book. Seems that Harold got out of New California at the right time. Hopefully, he's still alive. I long to hear more of his stories for myself and walk the wasteland through his eyes. That's all we really have in the end, you know? Whether it's talk of the old world, or what's happening on the other side of this dust bowl. Stories allow us to travel to places we've never actually been, live lives some of us can only dream of. Of course, that's just the handful of stories I've happened to stumble across in my days. The Wasteland has many more mysteries buried in its sands, and strangers like me are all too happy to share them with fellow travelers. Did I tell you about that time I took a riverboat down the Chesapeake Bay and met the inbred descendants of pre-war hillbillies in the swampy ruins of an old park? <laughs> uh, not really. All I wanted to know was where Nuka-Cola comes from, and you've been going on about the wasteland for four freaking hours. Yeah, now that I think about it, you barely said anything about Nuka-Cola. Well, <laughs> in the back when times, they took their soda pop mighty seriously. There's a robot cowboy over at the Sunset Sarsaparilla factory that'll tell you- Ah, uh, not again. <laughs> Honestly, I don't care anymore. <laughs> How do we even know this stuff is true? Half of it sounds made up. Talking death claws, aliens, a guy with a tree growing out of his brain. I mean, really, a tree? And you've been to some of these dangerous places yourself, and you're telling us you've never gotten killed. Not even a little. In the wasteland, a body either learns to survive or dies right quick. There's a lady that published a survival guide of sorts a few years ago. She lives in a town that has a pre-war bomb right in the middle. We don't care. <laughs> you already told us about Megaton like three times. Hey, if you know so damn much about this hellhole, why don't you cash in? You know, write your own book or something. You mean, like my own wasteland survival guide? Yeah, <laughs> no one would read that. Says you. Hey, mister, you never told us your name, by the way. Hey, where'd you go? Hmm. <laughs> Off to write his book. Hey. Hmm. You gonna finish that bottle of Nuka-Cola? Uh, hell yes I am. I had to fight off a group of raiders for this thing. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Plus three, three experience points. Damn. Wow. Just, just for Nuka Cola. Yep. All right. So uh, that was a fun ending. Um, <laughs> I guess, like a fitting ending with him killing the guy over over a Nuka Cola um, and ending like that. And I like, like, it's like. You've been talking for four hours, and all I asked you was about the origin of Nuka Cola. Um, looking forward to seeing what uh, they do in season two. I love how the storyteller is kind of like the old grandfather on a rocker, and that like you ask him a, a simple question, yeah. and you get the well back in my day, and like it goes into this huge thing about the origins of life itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that was very fun. I'm I'm so glad their little um, button at the end after the credits to say that. This storyteller has many more stories left in him and they're going to continue the journey mm -hmm. because I, I love that they continue to look on him as as the character that he is and like acknowledge that character. And this character has a lot to say. So, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm excited to see how this goes. This was a fun 
a fun button on the end of the first season. I feel bad for the guy that got shot for the Nuka Cola. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a nice little like recap there. Like, um, I thought when they started, it talked about Harold, I'm like, like, wasn't the guy that was the the, the tree? And then yeah, and like when they said like a branch started going out of his head, I'm like, okay, all right. So we got this is like sort of like a, a big recap. So I kept waiting for the storyteller. I'm like, I'm like, I want his his uh his story and like you know his origin and everything like that. Which we didn't really get in this, but it was still nice to have that little like extra scene there. And like so, it'll be interesting seeing like like they said instead of like talking about the world, he's gonna like being like exploring the world itself. Um, so I'm gonna be interested in how they do that. Yeah, absolutely. So for season two, since they're shorter episodes, uh, we're gonna do two at a time. Um, I guess it'll help us get through this series a little bit faster, but like the, these videos were like 12 to 16 minutes for season one and the next uh, season is like six to eight minutes for a video. So yeah, it just made sense uh, to do them two, two at a time. Sounds good. Let us know what you thought about this down below in the comments. And if you want early ad free access to our Fallout reactions, check out the description of this video because we got a link to our Patreon. Yeah. As well as a link to our playlist where you can see all of our Fallout reactions here. Yeah. Thanks so much for checking out our reaction for Fallout Storyteller Season 1, Episode 18, but just keep in mind. That our reaction is definitely not definitive.